Hello, I'm Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz, and this is part two of Breakthroughs in Intracellular Fluorescent Imaging. In this section, I'd like to talk about two techniques that have huge potential for allowing further insights using fluorescent protein technology for looking at events happening within cells as well as whole organisms. These two new applications include photobleaching and photoactivation. Now, the focus um, uh, in this talk is going to be in the endomembrane system and the use of these techniques for revealing a variety of different questions related to how this endomembrane system operates within eukaryotic cells. As we heard in the last section, the secretory membrane pathway is key for allowing molecules that are synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum to find their way out to the cell surface and ultimately be secreted from cells or to be internalized through the endocytic pathway to other final destinations within cells. Now, using fluorescent proteins, as I, told, as I discussed in the last uh, talk, um, researchers have been able to gain a, quite a bit of information about how these organelles that populate the endomembrane system behave as steady state systems. But in order to uh, determine how individual molecular populations within this system behave, we need additional tools to highlight select populations. And that's where photo, photo bleaching and photoactivation techniques come into play. So let me just give you an example. One of the uh, key properties of proteins that is important for how they function within bilayers is how they're integrated in the bilayer. Are these molecules free to diffuse randomly within the bilayer through Brownian motion? Or are they immobilized in some fashion through potentially binding to cytoskeletal components? Or are they assembled into large uh, molecular arrays or confined in some fashion uh, through uh, other molecular players. Using photobleaching techniques, it's possible to distinguish between these different characteristics of a pr uh, particular protein within the bilayer. So this uh, photobleaching technology involves the um, illumination with intense, uh, light, uh, intense light source of a particular area of the cell that's expressing a fluorescent protein. With that light, bright light source, what one can do is photobleach those molecules. Now, photobleaching is a property whereby a fluorophore is, is quenched. It can no longer emit fluorescence. And that is simply a result of the intense radiation causing the fluorophore to change its molecular conformation. And hence, uh, after the photobleaching, if you illuminate with low light, you see that the, the molecules that you have selectively photobleached are no longer visible. Now, if you selectively photobleach just a small area of the cell, what one can then do is image the cell with the low light irradiation and look to see whether molecules that have not been photobleached exchanged with the photobleached pool, such that over time the molecules now mix and you see a recovery process, so that now the photobleached area is uh, recovered and is, is bright. Under conditions where molecules undergo this type of uh, recovery process, you can take this data and actually plot it on a uh, graph and get insight into not only the half time that the recovery takes place, but also the extent to which the molecules are immobile or immobile based on the, the um, fraction um, of molecules that have undergone um, recovery to the initial uh, fluorescent state in the, in the region of interest. So this type of fluorescence recovery after photobleaching experiment called FRAP can be used to get lots of insights into different uh, molecular uh, organelles and sites within the cell. So let's look at how photobleaching has provided new insights 
into the dynamics of proteins that reside within organelles. This is a, uh, a photobleaching experiment of the Golgi apparatus, which serves as a central processing station within the secretory pathway. Now, what you're looking at are Golgi enzymes that have been tagged with GFP and expressed within a cell. And what is labeled is this beautiful Golgi ribbon, which we're going to be, pho which we're photobleaching across um, the center of. And what you can see in each of these photobleaching sequences is that the molecules very quickly recover into the photobleached region. What this indicates is that the enzymes that comprise the Golgi apparatus and are playing pivotal roles in modifying proteins that move through the secretory pathway, these enzymes are highly mobile within this organelle. Now this has an important implication for how proteins are retained within the Golgi apparatus. What this data is telling us is that the mechanism of retention of these enzymes is not related to them being immobilized uh, through interactions, tight interactions with other proteins within the cell. Rather, there must be some other basic mechanism that's retaining these molecules within this organelle in the face of secretory flux out of the Golgi onto the plasma membrane, which is characteristic of secretory cargo molecules. So these are, this is the behavior of Golgi enzymes within the Golgi apparatus. What about the endoplasmic reticulum and its associated nuclear envelope? As you can see from this photobleaching experiment, the proteins that reside within the endoplasmic reticulum are highly mobile, just as the molecules are within the Golgi apparatus. If, when you photobleach a select region within the endoplasmic reticulum, you can see very quick recovery. By contrast, when you look at the photobleaching recovery of molecules associated with the nuclear envelope, and in this case we're looking at the lamin B receptor, which is thought to help anchor the nuclear envelope to chromatin, what one sees is that these molecules are immobile uh, within the nuclear envelope. Most of these proteins are not freely diffusing. And it's this difference between the behavior of molecules on the nuclear envelope versus the ER that we think plays a fundamental role in the mechanism by which the nuclear envelope is able to form itself out of the endoplasmic reticulum in a dynamic process that allows for disassembly and reassembly during mitosis. Now let's move on to the plasma membrane where there's been a lot of excitement about the diffusional characteristics of proteins on this surface because the plasma membrane is what's facing the exterior of the cell and contains thousands of different types of receptors that are involved in signal transduction processes and how those individual molecules respond um, to, to uh, activating cues uh, in the membrane bilayer has been a focus of many, many different studies. Now here's a photobleaching experiment of a GFP-tagged KRAS, which is one of these uh, small GTP binding proteins that's involved in orchestrating signaling at the plasma membrane. And what you can see is that within 10 seconds, this lipid-anchored GTPase, KRAS, completely recovers into a photobleach box of about 10 microns in diameter and about 2 microns in um, width. What this indicates is that this molecule is uh, very uh, continuously exploring the entire surface of the plasma membrane on a very rapid time frame. Now, we and others have used photobleaching to look at the behavior of many other plasma membrane associated proteins, and some of these molecules are just illustrated here. And what you can see is that some of these proteins are full transmembrane embedded in the bilayer, and others are just lipid anchored. And using photobleaching techniques, we and others have been able to define the diffusion coefficients of these molecules, uh, been able to show that uh, these different proteins have different types of diffusion coefficients, largely dictated by how they're integrated into the membrane bilayer. Importantly, many of these molecules change their diffusion coefficient in response to signaling cues 
where the molecules undergo um, uh, clustering, aggregation, or uh, interaction with cytoskeletal elements that allow the molecules to move quickly in a directed fashion along the bilayer. Now, a whole different type of application of photo bleaching that I now want to briefly focus on is that which allows one to unravel a steady state distribution of proteins within the cell. What you're looking at in this image right here is the distribution of a protein um, called GPI-GFP. It's a sim simply a GFP molecule that's anchored to the plasma membrane or to membranes through a GPI anchor. What this protein does is distribute primarily on the plasma membrane of cells, but you can see that there's also a juxtanuclear pool of this GPI anchored protein which we know is localized in the Golgi apparatus. Now, if you were just looking under the microscope over time at the mo this molecule, all you would see were these two different pools of um, uh, populations of the molecule, the Golgi pool and the, pla the vastly larger plasma membrane pool. What you could not determine from these steady state observations is to what extent are these two pools of GFP, GPI, exchanging with each other? Are these molecules just stably or statically localized within these two different compartments within the cell, the Golgi and plasma membrane? Or are they in some way exchanging through intracellular transport trafficking pathways? Well, one way to distinguish between these two possibilities is to employ photo bleaching to selectively remove fluorescence uh, in one particular pool, as shown right here in this movie sequence. What we've just done is photo bleached this small area of the cell where the GPI-GFP is localized in the Golgi apparatus. And we're going to ask whether that pool can recover over time. Now, because these cells have been treated with cyclohexamide to block new protein synthesis, New, the reappearance of a signal in this bleached area could only be a result of transport of the molecules from the surrounding plasma membrane into the Golgi apparatus. This cell down here has been completely pho photo bleached and hence you see no recovery because the cells have been incubated with this drug cyclohexamide that blocks new protein synthesis. Now this recovery of the GPI molecules into the Golgi apparatus defines a intracellular trafficking pathway from plasma membrane to Golgi apparatus. And you can get insights into that pathway by quantifying the rate at which the exchange occurs. And that's shown right here in this little graph. Now, because we have quantitative information on the number of GFP molecules that are on the plasma membrane, versus in the Golgi apparatus prior to and after that photoactivation, you can, you can fit a, a very simple model of trafficking of these GPI anchored proteins between the Golgi and plasma membrane by simply fitting this curve to a very simple two-step two uh, compartmental exchange process. And from that, determine the residence time of these molecules in Golgi versus plasma membrane as well as the rate constants that define the uh, trafficking pathways to and from the Golgi apparatus. All of this information you can get simply by taking these images um, and quantifying them in a rigorous way. Now, it turns out that when you apply this type of photo bleaching to look at other molecules that are associated with the Golgi apparatus, and these include the resident enzymes that define the Golgi, uh, the uh, itinerant trafficking molecules that are cycling through the Golgi. What you find is that all of these molecules are undergoing a dynamic exchange in and out of the Golgi apparatus. In the case of the Golgi enzymes, they seem to be slowly cycling from the Golgi back into the endoplasmic reticulum and then back into the Golgi again. 
This next movie sequence just shows how dynamic cytosolic coat protein association with the Golgi is. What you're looking at is the association of a GFP tagged epsilon COP subunit, which is one of the subunits of the codomer complex called COP1 that's thought to be uh, playing a very important role in the formation of uh, uh, vesicle trafficking intermediates that operate within the Golgi. And what you can see uh, in this time lapse sequence is that these molecules uh, are constantly binding and dissociating to Golgi membranes as these uh, membranes are engaged in this membrane trafficking uh, system. So what this all means is that the Golgi apparatus, which is situated between the ER and the plasma membrane, is really a steady state organelle, which distinguishes it from the ER and plasma membrane, which are much more static, stable structures that don't change their overall architecture over the course of a cell's lifetime. The Golgi apparatus, because all of its components are cycling in and out of it, either through the plasma membrane and back or through the ER and back, has the capacity to undergo shape changes dramatically and respond to the extent of signaling and uh, movement through the secretory pathway. And we think this is part of the reason why the Golgi uh, is able to undergo such dramatic shape changes as I showed in the first talk um, uh, where it undergoes a complete breakdown in, uh, during mitosis or in response to drugs that perturb export of molecules out of the ER. Now, I'd like to move to another whole different strategy for switching on or highlighting populations of molecules within cells. And this strategy is using photoactivation. About six years ago, it was determined uh, that GFP, there are forms of GFP that can switch from being off to on. And that's illustrated in this little diagram right here. This is a cell uh, that is being imaged at 488 nanometer light. And you can see, you don't see anything. But upon a, uh, activation, of this molecule with UV light of about 400 nanometer, all of the molecules that contain this photoactivatable fluorescent protein switch on and are now fluorescent. So this approach of photoactivating molecules um, can be used as a tool to, to selectively switch on molecules within the cell and track them. And a very important molecule that uh, is being used for doing all of these experiments is this photoactivatable form of GFP that behaves in this fashion. So the next slide just shows an example um, of a type of photoactivation uh, experiment. So here what is being done is the cell is being the pool of molecules in the Golgi apparatus um, that uh, have accumulated um, as a result of transport through the secretory pathway are being switched on in a moment of time as a result of photoactivation. So the cells were uh, transfected with a photoactivatable VSVG molecule and the molecules were allowed to move through the secretory pathway. To visualize the pool of these molecules in the Golgi apparatus, the researchers selectively switched on the molecules associated with the Golgi apparatus. And these black structures right here represent switched on highlighted molecules. And you can see them flow out of the Golgi apparatus as part of the secretory uh, system. Now, the information that one gets from this type of uh, video is really amazing. Um, what it allows you to do is to quantify not only the extent and the, the type of transport intermediates that are leaving the Golgi apparatus, but you can characterize the kinetics of that process. And this has proved very useful in allowing researchers to address questions related to how molecules are actually moving through the Golgi apparatus. Now, in this little uh, uh, 
cartoon uh, depiction, what you're looking at is the prediction of how molecules, if they were switched on within the Golgi apparatus in green, would progress out of this, out of this organelle over time. If the Golgi apparatus behaves as a progressing stack of cisternae, the Golgi we know exists as a stack of cisternae, and it's been thought for many years that the way that this organelle is able to drive uh, transport through this stack is through a progressive process. Essentially, there's new cisternae that are being formed at the cis face of the Golgi, and old cisternae at the trans face are being consumed in transport intermediates that move to the plasma membrane. And so the way proteins are thought to be conveyed through the Golgi is by the cisternae undergoing a gradual maturation. Well, what you can see in this, uh, this diagram down here is what is predicted for a pool of molecules situated in the Golgi being exported out of the Golgi over time. Now, uh, previously, people had no way of actually doing this experiment because you couldn't highlight molecules selectively within an individual Golgi of a cell. But with these photoactivatable fluorescent proteins, that is possible. And it has allowed researchers to go in and actually test this key prediction of the cisternal maturation model. And what was observed is instead of seeing linear export kinet kinetics as predicted by cisternal maturation, for at least three different types of cargo within the Golgi, the export kinetics seemed to show something very different. It showed an exponential release uh, profile. Now what this implies is that when the molecules in the Golgi um, are being exported, they're being exported at a random rate through a, a, a process that's akin to radioactive decay, where no molecule has any preference over any other molecule for being exported with time. As you can see in this little diagram right here, what we're seeing using photoactivation techniques and photo hi and highlighting techniques is that the molecules seem to be exponentially released from this organelle in a process that we think probably involves some type of rapid mixing and then export from multiple sites within this structure. Now, how could sorting occur within the Golgi if this type of, this type of mechanism was operating? And again, GFP imaging techniques are providing some clues. And one particular clue is seen in this little movie here where we're looking at the behavior of a cargo protein passing through the Golgi apparatus at the same time as an enzyme that's retained within the Golgi apparatus. And what you see in this movie is that as soon as the cargo, which is primarily yellow in this movie, arrives at the Golgi apparatus, it's very quickly partitioning to areas that are depleted of areas where the enzymes that are primarily enriched in blue in this movie are localized. So this su suggests that within the Golgi apparatus, these proteins are undergoing a type of mass uh, membrane partitioning to particular areas of this organelle. And that has led to the following uh, view of how the uh, Golgi apparatus might be functioning. Um, and the idea would be that proteins that are ferried into the Golgi apparatus are sorting within the Golgi apparatus based on a type of membrane affinity whereby proteins that have affinity for sphingolipids and cholesterol, which populate primarily the Golgi and the plasma membrane, move to areas where these cholesterol and sphingolipids are enriched in this structure and hence get carried out of the Golgi apparatus in vesicles that move to the plasma membrane. Molecules that prefer to be in an environment that's primarily enriched in sphingolip uh, phosphoglycerides, which are much thinner, uh, that form much thinner bilayers, instead are retained within the Golgi apparatus and engage in a cycling back into the endoplasmic reticulum and hence are not carried with cargo out of the Golgi apparatus onto the plasma membrane. Now this is a speculative model at this point uh, and deserves 
much greater uh, investigation. But it illustrates well, I think, how using these new tools of photo activation and imaging can provide potentially new information about the way organelles like the Golgi apparatus are operating during secretory trafficking. Now I want to just give one other example of how photoactivation uh, can be used to get new insights into dynamics of organelles. And in this example, we're going to be looking at peroxisome biogenesis. Now peroxisomes are interesting organelles because they have their own ability to import proteins. And as you can see, these little, these are hundreds of small little structures scattered throughout the cytoplasm. In green here are individual peroxisomes that are being imaged. For years, people have wondered where these organelles come from. Are they formed de novo? Or is some other organelle playing an important role in their formation? So in order to address this question, we and others used photoactivation techniques to try to see whether we could highlight a compartment uh, whose membranes might provide the source for, uh, for uh, the formation of these peroxisomes. And so in this experiment, PEC16, which is a peroxisomal membrane protein um, that's involved in the formation, uh, the, the formation of um, the import apparatus in peroxisomes, was tagged with photoactivatable GFP. And what's being done in this experiment is that the pool of these molecules that's seen in the endoplasm reticulum is selectively switched on by highlighting with photoactivation. And what that does over the course of a few hours of selective photoactivation of the endoplasmic, the ER pool of this peroxisomal protein is label the entire ER um, population of this molecule. So after switching on the molecules selectively in the ER in this fashion, what one can then do is just look over time at what happens to this photoactivated, photoactivated pool. Now, because once you stop photoactivating these molecules, no new proteins will become fluorescent because the only way proteins become fluorescent in these experiments is to photoactivate them. You can image the photoactivated pool over long periods of time and look at the fate of those molecules. And what one sees, if the one does that, in the case of this PEC16, is that it moves from the endoplasm reticulum to peroxisomes, implying that the early membrane components that create the peroxisomes are derived from the endoplasm reticulum. So these experiments and others have given rise to this particular model for how peroxisomes form within cells. The idea is that key peroxisomal components that are involved in importing molecules into these organelles are directed uh, for synthesis in the ER using machinery that's uh, classically used for many other proteins that are synthesized in the ER. And then once these molecules have been produced in the ER, they cluster in some fashion to create a subdomain of the ER that ultimately buds off to form a bona fide peroxisome over time. So what this is telling us is that these peroxisomes, which play very important roles in not only fatty acid metabolism, but also the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide uh, uh, toxic products within your uh, body, are formed fundamentally by an outgrowth process um, from the endoplasm reticulum. Now I want to give one other example of how these photoactivation, photoactivatable fluorescent proteins uh, can be utilized. I mentioned that once you photoactivate a protein population within cells, it's only those molecules that are visible. So any newly synthesized protein within the cell that is not photoactivated will not be visible. As a consequence of that, you can switch on all of the molecules of a protein of interest that are tagged with the photoactivatable fluorescent protein, and then subsequently image it over time. Because no new proteins will be switched on, 
during this period because you, you're only doing one photoactivation event. You can now look at the turnover of this population of molecules. And this is illustrated here in this uh, example right here for the CD3 delta subunit of the T cell antigen receptor, which is known to have a very short half-life in cells where it's expressed as an orphan receptor subunit. So in these cells, we've switched on the CD3 delta tag with photoactivatable GFP at time zero, and then looked at the fate of this molecule over time. And within six hours, you can see there's no molecule left within the cell. And that uh, fits very, this is a biochemical uh, metabolic chase experiment to verify that all of these molecules are being destroyed during this process. Now, this is a, a useful technique because not only does it allow you to monitor the time course by which molecules are degraded, and in this case, the CD3 delta we know is being degraded by retrotranslocation of the protein out of the ER into the cytoplasm and destruction by the proteasome. Now, in addition to just looking at this turnover process, you can use what's known about these degradative pathways to probe the characteristics of that pathway. For instance, to block proteasome activity and to look at how these molecules distribute in response to not being broken down. And in the case of the CD3 delta subunit, when we inhibit the proteasome, we've seen large aggregates form in response to the uh, inability of these molecules to be degraded within cells. Now another type of uh, strategy that you can do to look at turnover is to look at turnover not only of proteins, but to look at turnover of whole organelles. And I just want to, in my ending uh, uh, sort of vignette, show an example of this for aut autophagosomes. So autophagosomes form in response to starvation. And this is just showing how you build up these small little uh, particular structures in the cytoplasm in response to starvation. We're labeling these structures with a, cytos with a uh, GFP tagged marker, LC3, that labels specifically autophagosomal membranes. Now, once these autophagosomes form, they then move in a very directed fashion to lysosomes for destruction. Now, this is a, plays a key role in cell survival because the autophagosomal membrane initiates as a cup-like structure that can then engulf portions of the cytoplasm, which it then envelops and delivers to the lysosome for destruction as a consequence of the hydrolytic enzymes found within the lysosome. And this is just, this movie here is just illustrating how you can visualize this fusion of the autophagosome with lysosomes. But with the photoactivatable fluorescent proteins, we can now ask how long does it take for these autophagosomes uh, to fuse with lysosomes? Uh, what is the lifetime of an autophagosome within the cell? And this is shown in this little movie sequence here, where now this key autophagosomal marker, LC3, is tagged with a photoactivatable form of GFP. And right now you don't see any molecules because we haven't switched them on, but upon photoactivating the entire cellular population, you can then see these molecules within autophagosomes and then track how the autophagosomes disappear over time. And this movie sequence reveals that the, half the average half time for an autophagosome life in a starved cell is only about 18 minutes. So you'd never be able to determine this just looking using a GFP probe uh, because molecules are being synthesized at the same rate as these molecules are being degraded. But because these photoactivatable fluorescent proteins are switched on and are only fluorescent as a consequence of that photoactivation, you have a way to pulse chase pools of molecules to follow not only molecular lifetimes, but as shown in this sequence here, organellar lifetimes within cells as well. So what I've told you in this talk today is a variety of different um, techniques um, that allows you to highlight discrete populations 
um, of proteins as well as organelles within cells in order to define um, how steady state systems are operating at a kinetic, in a, in a kinetic framework. Um, what I'm going to do in the next talk is to provide another type of application uh, using these photoactivatable fluorescent proteins to now look at super resolution at how individual molecules behave within cells instead of large populations of proteins as we have looked at until now.